You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 196, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. And I think you know why. Yeah, because you <laughs> had a Christmas, good Christmas? Yeah, yeah, that, that was part of it. Uh, you had a Happy New Year? Yep, yep, yeah, keep well, going. Uh, <laughs> maybe because you got lucky and won fantasy football? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not luck when you're guided by the uh Lombardi of fantasy football. I saw that trophy you posted by, by on Pug Mori, yeah. Facebook. What what now where was my trophy when I won last year? Where where'd you get that trophy? That was a good looking trophy. I, I, I just got it because I thought, hey, you know, this is Maury uh I the first year I got smart enough to make Maury my general manager and he deserved a trophy. Wow. I couldn't find one made of like dog biscuits, so I figured that was good enough. Yeah, that's a good looking trophy. Well, I guess I also won my Lagos Fantasy League, and I'm in the Super Bowl for one of my brother's leagues. So I'm having a good year. Lagos. A... Do they even watch? Do they know what football is in that league? I figured they'd be there. So busy there are a handful. Of, well, no, they're no, they're they're into things like soccer and you know, rock climbing, you know, it's just whatever, <laughs> but you know, you know, they could, they could tell you like who won the tour de France and who liked the, you know, climbed X, Y, Z, you know, mountain, but they can't tell you much about football, but there are a few people in the company that um, are not hopeless and they are part of the league. So Mike, one thing you will never see me do is rock climb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, ditto. <laughs> I don't, I won't even watch it. It's there just you. like one of the, I don't I don't really want to watch people die, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well there you go. So all right Mike, well, I take it you didn't bow down to your Christmas tree last week, so you had a good Christmas. Got Yeah, I did not. Good, okay. And uh, uh we we gave it gave it scant attention. You didn't um worship it by giving it presents and then <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, all of our presents we had it in mind. You and New Year's, are y'all doing anything fun for the New Year? Oh, we're, we we went over to uh, a friend's house, so we usually don't do anything, but we got invited this year, so why not? Any New Year's resolution? Quit no. smoking? Anything no. like that? No. No? I, I, I don't make resolutions. Boom. <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> there you go. All right, Mike. Well, Hebrews 10, Christ's yeah. sacrifice once and for all. What do we got? Yeah, in Hebrews 10, again, this is for those who have been listening for a while, you know, we've been on the theme off and on, mostly on, uh, since Hebrews chapter 5 of Christ's high priesthood and his sacrifice. And I mentioned way back then, hey, this is going to run all the way through chapter 10. And so here we are. Uh, we're, we're still in that content in terms of its its theme, you know, sort of the emphasis but this will be the last chapter uh, for for that. We'll transition to you know, some other things beyond chapter ten. But we're still here. But, but there, believe it or not, there's still actually a few things that either are interesting to think about. There's going to be one item in here that is going to be. And I'll, I'll just I'll be honest. You know, it's 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 hard for us to understand why the writer of Hebrews would do what he does with a particular Old Testament passage. So there's going to be something new here that that is different. It's difficult to to understand. And other than that, there are places where previous ideas get punctuated here once again. So uh, the, the good news you know, for that is not, not that it's just redundant and repetitious, but that it, it shows us once again what the most important things are in the mind of the writer. And that's why he keeps returning to them. So let's just jump into to Hebrews 10. I'll read the first four verses to get started. Again, reading from the ESV, it says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have been ceased to be offered, since the worshippers 
having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in, the, the, in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, that, that's the first four verses. And this is, again, this is pretty pointed language about the insufficiency of Torah, the insufficiency of the law. I mean, if you just follow the logic here, uh, you know, the, the law is just a shadow of the good things to come, okay, instead of the true form of these realities, these realities being the stuff he's talked about up to this point, about the high priesthood of Christ, about Christ's sacrifice, about Christ being seated at the right hand of majesty, so on and so forth, the superiority of what Jesus did on the cross, the cross event to the, the Torah and to its sacrifices and whatnot. Not only could the sacrifices not remove you know, sin. They didn't take care of the sin problem, both in terms of human fallibility, obviously, you know, and, and humans are going to sin. So e even the cross event of Jesus is not is no guarantee that, you know, Christians aren't going to sin. And Scripture teaches the opposite of that. First John, you know, if we say we have no sin, you know, we make God a liar, you know, we, we deceive ourselves, so on and so forth. But what he's talking about here is is the the inadequacy of the sacrifices to actually absolve a person of moral guilt. And for those who listen to the Leviticus series that we did, that is not an unfamiliar idea. The, the law, uh, the sacrificial laws, the sacrificial system was not about absolving people of moral guilt. It was really about decontaminating sacred space. It was about, you know, insulating uh, mere mortals uh, who might be unclean or had become unclean. It was about taking care of a of an uncleanness problem in terms of them being allowed to approach sacred space, them being allowed to participate uh, in in you know the, the the system by which their relationship to both the community, you know, people of Israel, you know people of God, the family of God itself, and God could be restored or remedied or again you know sort of just whatever the the contamination was that that's removed and taken care of so if you were an, an israelite and you went through the you know the, the sacrificial system the rituals or whatever the you know the you did things as they were prescribed to be done god would look at you and say okay you know we're we're okay now you're not going to pollute my presence let's try it again okay you're you're not you're not unclean. You're not contaminated. Uh, you, you never get this notion that, you know, I look at you now as though you'd never sinned. Okay? That, that is not an Israelite Old Testament idea uh, as it relates to the sacrificial system. I mean, there, there are broader, uh, you know, perspectives about sin and, and relationship with God that, that sort of transcend the sacrificial system. But what we're talking about here, what the writer of Hebrews is talking about is, Specifically, what the Torah describes to do, you know, for certain types of violation. And again, from the Leviticus series, if you committed a serious, you know, crime, you committed adultery, you did X, Y, Z, you know, th there wasn't a sacrifice for that. You either had the death penalty, or you had to pay restitution. You had to make things right with the person you offended, or there were some, you know, sins, you know, that there just wasn't a sacrifice for that. The sacrificial system itself, again, was about sacred space, decontamination of it, you know, protecting it from contamination, and making the participants clean, i.e., not morally, you know, guiltless now, but but able, in a contaminative sense, to participate in the system. That's what it was about. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, that that just is inferior to what we have. In Jesus, it's because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we are allowed to enter His presence, and beyond that, we do have the forgiveness of sins. We 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 have been cleansed. We are new creations. You know all all this sort of New Testament language, and not only that, but even even better, still better, is it's it's permanent. We don't have to keep doing these things. We don't have to you know sacrifice the Son of God you know anew. Uh, in fact, that that's an abominable idea, sort of casting what happened at the cross in you know, or, or filtering what happened through the to uh, happen at the cross through the filter of the Old Testament sort of ritualistic, repetitive system. 
that, that that's to the writer of Hebrews, that's an abominable, uh, abominable thing. So no matter what angle you look at it, what he's saying, what, what we have is just so much better in, in, in every way. And the law, again, was this shadow. The shadow is kind of an interesting term here, skia in Greek. You know, it, it's clear that sacrifices, again, from what we read, were both temporary and in terms of the actual removal of moral guilt, they were ineffective. Now, few would argue that. Uh, I don't. I don't think that, like for instance, you know, the, the Hebrew roots people. Again, the, the more extreme versions of that. I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some some of them do argue that we should go back to animal sacrifices. I I don't know, but I, I would think that that at least that much would be obvious. So I don't think that they're arguing for bringing back animal sacrifices. But what else? It's kind of interesting to ask this question. Because you could have, you know, somebody that that's again sort of, you know, on the periphery here with the Hebrew roots saying, you know, movement saying, well, we, we don't argue that we should have sacrifices come back. You know, we still, you know, we still believe in Jesus and all that. But then they want to cling, you know, to other elements of the law. So it's interesting to ask the question, well, what else does the New Testament describe with the same word? Shadow, skia. What what else does the New Testament sort of put in that kind of same category or or cast the same way? Terms not used very often. In Colossians 2.17, we get it. In that verse, we have the, the verse itself says, these are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So what are the these things? If we actually go look at Colossians 2, the previous verse says this, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And then he goes off in verse 18, and he sort of, you know, hits, hits you know, the, the pagans with the, the worship of angels and all that kind of stuff. But here in 16 and 17, I mean, he, what's the shadow there? It's food and drink laws. It's the Sabbath, new moon, that's the, lo- 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 the lunar calendar of the Israelite calendar, the Torah calendar, festivals. You know, those things are a shadow of the good things to come. So why are we preferring the shadow, the precursor, the warm-up, the the ineffectual um, of of lesser value to God things than Christ? You know, why why are we referring preferring the inferior instead of the superior? Doesn't make any sense. Uh, Hebrews eight five. You also get this this terminology, skia, again, the, the shadow. It says, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. That's the verse proper. Now, if you, uh, if we go actually to the context, again, and move back a few, a few you know, verses, that was Hebrews 8, 5, we go back to verse 1. We read this. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Again, remember our, our, our episode on this, the, the tabernacle was made by virtue of human agency. Yes, God commanded it be built, but you know people built it. So that's, that's what's behind this reference to human involvement. But the true tent is one that's created only by the Lord. And we talked about how, again, that, that becomes sort of an analogous way of thinking about the gospel, again, the work of Christ, that God accepts the work of Christ, you know, the propitiation for sins, you know, all this kind of stuff, all, everything that's involved with that. That was God's doing because Christ is the God-man and God the Father, and we're going to get this in Hebrews 10, God the Father and God the Son were the ones who, in eternity past, conceived of this plan. It, it, it's God through and through from start to finish. It has nothing to do with people. See, it, it, this, this comment about the true tent and the, and, the, and the Torah tent, the tabernacle, becomes an analogous way of thinking about things that, that are really all of God and things that are in some way involving human effort. And it, it, it's a contrast for, for the gospel. It's either grace through faith, and that's it end of story, or we have, you know, some sort of works, merit-based kind of thinking. So the writer of Hebrews, again, uses you know, this as an analogy to, to talk about salvation, you know, being exclusively by faith through grace, or grace through faith, you know, whichever way you want to say it. And again, some system that has 
human involvement, i.e. the law. You know, and back to Hebrews 8, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since the priests who offer gifts, or pri- since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Okay, so th- th- this idea uh, again, not just of the sacrificial system. This here's the point: we're not we're not just talking about the insufficiency of the sacrificial system. The writer of Hebrews is talking about the insufficiency of any any system, including Torah, including the law, whereby people could presume or actually teach, you know, sort of more overtly, that salvation was about human merit and performance. And the point being that salvation has nothing to do with human perfectibility, human performance works. Okay? It has everything to do with what happened on the cross. And so Again, his, his fundamental question is not to belittle the things you know associated with the law, but to elevate the high priestly ministry and sacrifice of Jesus. It's not that he's you know cutting down one. What he's doing is he's putting things in their proper place. He's putting things in proper perspective. He's not saying that the law was bad, bad law, sinister law, icky law. He's not doing that. He's just saying this was one thing. And it's inferior to this other thing. One was a shadow of the other. One was a precursor to the other. And the other is what happened on the cross with Jesus. That is superior. So he's trying to elevate that above Torah, not say Torah was bad. And I think that's important you know, for us you know, to, to keep in perspective as well. You know, Paul had a very high view of the law. He had a, he had a positive view of the law, like Romans you know, 7, okay? He had a love for the law, even, you know, because he uses that kind of language uh, in in Romans, especially, and and in a few other places. Paul had a high view of the law, but he had a higher view of Jesus, and that's how we need to look at these things. We don't need to denigrate one, you know, for the other. We just need to keep things in proper perspective. So Hebrews ten five. Let's continue. He says the writer says, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. That's Hebrews ten five through 7 This is a, kind of an interesting passage because what's here is sort of cast as a conversation between the two, you know, the, the first and second members of the Trinity, okay, between God the Son and God, you know, the Father, okay, Christ and God, and however you want to say that, the two members, those two members of the, of the Trinity. This is like a conversation. It's linked to the incarnation because of the phrase, when Christ came into the world. Okay, that would be the, the point of incarnation. The author of, of Hebrews appropriates some Old Testament stuff, you know, to make this point. Now, Guthrie uh, at, at this um, juncture says this, just a little, little excerpt from Guthrie's uh, his Hebrews commentary. Or actually, it's actually, this comes from his comments in uh, Beale's commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. He writes, the author appropriates the psalm as being explicitly fulfilled by Christ, quote, when he comes into the world. That's verse 5. This language is distinct from that used as an introductory formula in Hebrews 1.6, where the author employs oikumene, a Greek word there that gets translated world, which can be interpreted as a reference to the heavenly realm. But here, in Hebrews 10, we have the use of cosmos, world, along with the context. That word, along with the context, suggests here that the incarnation is in mind. And he has something you know, in mind of what's going on on earth, not you know, specifically when Christ came into the, the world of the heavens. That's not his point, Guthrie is saying. Specifically, what this, again, conversation between the two members of the Trinity has in view is the incarnation. So it's kind of an interesting way to, to, to sort of see that comparing Hebrews 1.6 when it uses oikumene, which can be talking about heavenly realms, and here you have cosmos. So it's a way to, to sort of, again, look at this and say, what, what he has in mind here is the incarnation. So, And, and that's kind of obvious from the context, because in verse 
uh, verse um, verse five, the second half, a body you have prepared for me, kind of makes the incarnation sort of obvious. Another sort of thing to mention in passing here, these three verses, okay, these three verses, Hebrews 10, five through seven, I'll, I'll just read them again. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. That's just verse five. We'll stop there. Think about what that says. It really cuts against adoptionist Christology in a pretty clear way. Now, adoptionist Christology is the idea that Jesus, that Jesus of Nazareth, the man, became the Son of God. He was adopted by God, like at his baptism, you know, some, at some point. People typically put it at the baptism. And that kind of undermines, um, well, I shouldn't say it that way. It's used by some people to undermine things like virgin birth and incarnation, you know, God actually being man, you know, that, that sort of thing. Here, in other words, God picks a guy, Jesus of Nazareth, and says, oh, you're going to be my son. You're going to be the, 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 the tool now for, for salvation. And then either, you know, like, the, the, the Gnostic version of this kind of thinking is that the, the Christos, you know, came and inhabited this guy at this, this point. And that, that is not what's in view here. What's in view here very clearly in Hebrews 10, 5, is that prior to the incarnation, you know, God the Son and God the Father had a conversation, they had a plan that involved the second member of the Trinity having a body. Okay, and you know, a body you've prepared for me. This really undercuts, uh, in my mind, adoption as Christology in a significant way. Now let's talk about uh, these three verses. And here's here's the sort of the difficulty that I mentioned uh, as we started uh, the episode. Here, there's something here that really, honestly, might uh, sound troubling uh, to some, and you know, it's a little bit hard for us to understand. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna prep it this way. We're used to thinking about the letters of the New Testament getting written, and then they get copied and passed around, and and sort of like, well, you know, they, they copy it a lot, and then everybody has, their, everybody has a Bible. You know, everybody's going to be reading this. Okay, most people in antiquity did not have Bibles. Most people in antiquity lived and died without ever seeing one. They might have seen a portion of something. Maybe if they were, if they were Jewish, they, they could walk into a synagogue, and they might have a Torah scroll there, a, a whole one. Uh, they, they, they'd see it. They'd see it pulled out, and then a portion read. Okay, people don't have Bibles. This is still largely an oral, oral and aural culture. People would go to synagogue, they would go to church and hear things read out loud. That's just the way it was done. You had a lot of you know, just think about the composition of the early church. You got a lot of slaves, you know, Gentiles, uh, you know, Gentiles or Jews, you got a lot of slaves, you know, there's a lot of underground stuff going on. You know, you you have Obviously, the use of the Septuagint. If anybody has something written, it's typically going to be the Septuagint. Um, but you've got various levels of literacy, uh, various levels of access to any of this material. Everything has to be done by hand. There's no printing press. I mean, we have to remember these things. So chances are, when you met as a community, as a church, you know, as a as a as you know, a family of believers, a group of believers, somebody would have something. And you would read it out loud, or you would talk about maybe uh, you know something you had heard before. Nobody shows up there with their Bible in tow, and they're all sitting there with the Bible open on their laps. It's just not the way it happened, not the way it was done. And and that matters for this particular issue. There's a reason why I gave that little setup. What we have going on here in Hebrews ten five through seven is a quotation of the Septuagint of Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, but there is a significant difference in the wording of the Septuagint as compared to the Hebrew text of Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8 in the Masoretic text. There's a really significant difference here. So I'm gonna, let me read you what we have in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 once more. This, this comes from the Septuagint. It's not completely you know, quoted in its entirety from the from the Septuagint, but it largely uh, follows the Septuagint. Here we go. So the writer says, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, now here's the, the, the beginning of the quotation, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. 
Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, if you go to Psalm 40, okay, here's what, here's what you read. Here's the Masoretic text. Here's the Hebrew text, not the Septuagint, but the, the Masoretic text. This is what, what it says pretty literally here. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. So where the Masoretic text has open ear, the Septuagint has body. It's quite different. It's quite different. And the, the I'm, let me just read what Guthrie says here. And then uh, actually this is, yeah, this is, this is Hagner actually. Uh, he writes, here, the Septuagint appears to be an interpretation of the Hebrew, which reads literally, ears you have dug for me. Okay, instead of body, you have ears you have dug for me. A body you've prepared for me, that's Septuagint. Ears you have dug for me is the Masoretic text. Most translations, back to the quotation, including King James New American Standard, RSV, of this line in Hebrew of Hebrew in Psalm 40, verse 6, take the words in the sense of the new RSV, quote, you have given me an open ear. It's another way to translate. That is, able to hear and thus obey. The Septuagint translators, however, took the words as an allusion to the creation of Adam's body, which being fashioned by God out of clay, would have required the digging out of the ears, as in the making of a sculpture. The words were highly appropriate when put into the mouth of the incarnate Christ, a body you have prepared for me. Christ could not have fulfilled the will of God explicitly. He could not have died without a body. Now, you you read that, that's the end of the quote, and you go, what in the world is going on? It just seems like the Septuagint translator, whoever that was, was like, just on something. You know, what, why in the world would you look at the Hebrew text and, you know, this idea of carving or digging out or making ears, you know, the, that kind of thing. Why would your mind go from that to, oh, yeah, it's like Adam. You know, when Adam was made from the dust of the ground, that dirt, you know, God had to fashion his body. And boy, the, yeah, when and you're fashioning a body, you got to make the ears so that the, the human can hear you and obey you. And so I'm going to translate this part, a body, you've prepared for me. That seems like fairly convoluted thinking, but it is actually what the writer of Hebrews quotes instead of the Masoretic text. And, and you got to wonder, again, it, it just feels like there's some sort of deliberate misquotation going on here or some sort of kind of arcane, self-styled, imaginative theologizing going on. Now, here, here's the issue. It is sort of a deliberate misquotation. It's deliberate in terms of the choice of the Septuagint translator. In other words, the author, both the translator and the writer of Hebrews, they're not inept. They are doing something here. There's a reason why the writer of Hebrews prefers this uh, for his audience. It's actually for the purposes of drawing attention to something in particular, to hearers of the text instead of readers. Now, there's an article on this, and I'm going to post this on the episode page. And honestly, you, you probably have to have a little Greek, maybe a little bit of kind of English literature or literary panache, you know, to, to really follow the, the, this, this thinking, this article. But I'm going to put it up anyway. It's by Karen Jobes, who's a Septuagint specialist. And the, the article is entitled, The Function of, I always get this, I always struggle with pronouncing this, The Function of paranomasia in Hebrews 10.7. I'm going to put it on the episode page now. Paranomasia comes from, this is, this is Webster now, comes from the Greek paranomazain, which means to call with a slight change of name. In other words, this is a, a fancy literary term for a play on words, a pun. And what Jobes is going to argue, what she shows in this article, is that the writer of Hebrews picks the Septuagint because it creates wordplay with other parts of the content of Hebrews 10. In other words, it's a deliberate choice on the part of whoever composed Hebrews 10 that he sees in the Greek text of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of this this particular psalm, 
a convenient way to create word plays in his own material, with his own material, in his own, you know, in his own argument. The, the thing that he wants people to zero in on, which in the context of Hebrews 10 is the person and work of Christ, the high priest. He sees things in that psalm, in the Septuagint version, that will make that task easier for him, or it's, it's an issue of convenience. He's a writer. He picks that translation particularly because it, it affords him the opportunity to create wordplay. And what, again, why would he do that? Because he knows that most of the people who are going to get his content are going to hear it, not read it. It's a deliberate choice on the writer's part because if we use these wordings and I can create these word plays, people listening carefully, their attention will be drawn specifically to ideas that I want them to walk away with. Now, it, you know, for me personally, this is kind of interesting when writers will do this sort of thing. And it, it's complicated. Again, I'm going to I'm putting the Job's article up there. It, it's it doesn't translate well to to a podcast episode. You more or less have to see it, and you'd, you'd probably at least have to know the Greek alphabet to see kind of what's going on. But this is the kind of thing. I, I, actually, there's a lot of these kinds of things that really defy ideas. Like all prophecy is interpreted literally. I'm sorry, but that's just not true. Okay, the, 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 the biblical writers don't always take a prophecy literally. They don't always take the Old Testament literally. They do things like this because they are literary artists. They are skilled communicators. God allows them to use their skills to produce the stuff that we call Scripture. He is not whispering the content into their ear. He is not dictating stuff. Okay, this, all, this goes back, as, as many things that we have discussed on this podcast before, this goes back to a flawed view, a flawed way that we are taught about inspiration. When you, when you muck around in the text, like New Testament scholars have to do, like Old Testament scholars have to do, you know, theologians, systematic theologians, people who do English Bible, they never, they never see this kind of stuff. They never get to it. They never get into it. It's not on the radar because that's just not what, that's not their scholarly field. They, they do different things, again, to earn their degrees and do what they do. But the, the people who are the text geeks, the people who have to, to look at the text, they run into these things a lot. Not, you know, not just wordplay issues like this, but other things that are happening in the text that, that honestly, the best word I, I can think of is honestly just defy the way we are taught about inspiration, the way we are taught about uh, biblical interpretation. There is a, there's a spectrum of ways that Scripture gets interpreted by other Scripture writers. This, this notion of this one-to-one -one literalism kind of thing just doesn't work in a number of places. And here you actually have a situation where the writer prefers a translation of the Hebrew text that is very, you know, let's be honest, you know, the, the Septuagint tr translation of this, you know, getting a body instead of ears you've carved out for me, it's highly interpretive. The Septuagint is highly interpretive here, but the writer of Hebrews likes it because it allows him to create memorable wordplay in his own material he finds that useful. Again, to helping hearers zero in on specific items that he wants them to walk away with. It, what, what happens in Scripture, in the production of Scripture, it, we, again, the way we're taught, we, we are taught to intentionally minimize the human activity. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. When you minimize the humanity of Scripture, you undermine inspiration. You undermine it. You make it vulnerable to criticism. You, you, anybody who, who's, who's listening to this and has some of these, again, traditional yet flawed views of inspiration, again, if I were an enemy of Scripture, if I were an enemy of the gospel, if I were an enemy of, of Christ or the faith, I could destroy the idea of inspiration, right? It, it would go up in flames right in front of your eyes. But, but 
that would be illegitimate. That would be cheating on my part as a critic because I would be then dishonest, you know, because I'm using a caricature of inspiration to undermine the whole idea. And, th- and that's where, that's where critics of scripture, you know, your, your, your sort of hate mongers among, you know, the, the atheist community or whatever, that's what they do. They're guilty of caricature, but, but we are taught a lot of our a lot of Christians are taught caricature positions on things like prophecy and inspiration, and they are made vulnerable. They are made vulnerable to unscrupulous you know, critics, people who who hate the faith. They are made vulnerable to those people and the kinds of of arguments they will make, the kinds of things they will show you in your own Bible. If you only have one way to process those things, then you know you're in trouble. So what we try to do again on on, on this podcast is to get people just to think better about you know how we got this thing called the bible and what biblical writers are doing under the influence under divine influence you know, inspiration is a process it's not an event it's not a series of paranormal events god prepared the writers from the moment you know they were born all the way up to the moment that they were confronted with the task of writing whatever it is they were going to write to be included in this thing we call the bible god is in that process some writers providentially again because of providence they were they were very skilled literary artists the writer of hebrews if, if you go all the way back to the introduction to the book the, the greek of hebrews is rivaled only by the greek of luke okay in, in terms of its difficulty and its 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 elegance okay you know the, whoever wrote the book of hebrews was a highly skilled writer and communicator he was a rhetorician uh, of of really you know high status and it's stuff like this that actually shows that. Okay, that, that's, that all happened under the providence of God, this person's training, their ability, their proclivities to do certain things in writing that they did. And in this case, he specifically has in mind how this would play, okay, pun intended, how this would play to an oral audience using wordplay. That's just what they did, again, to make it memorable. Let's go to verse 8 now. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. And this is still part of the conversation between the the two members of the Trinity, the, the Father and the Son. He added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away. Okay, when, when, when that conversation, you know, happened, he does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So in a nutshell, the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, because they had this conversation and they decided it was the will of God to set aside the shadow in favor of preparing a body for the second person of the Trinity to come to earth and accomplish salvation, because that was the will of God. He has done away with the first stuff. He's done away with the precursor in order to establish the second. And by that will, by his will, we all, we're the beneficiaries. We've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, and I ask again, if Jesus did away with the shadow things, the temporary things, why do we want them back? Again, shadow things, Colossians 2.17, food and drink laws, Sabbath, new moon, festivals. Hebrews 8, 5, you know, the, the stuff that the high priest did, okay? Now, you know, we just did an episode on, on Christmas, and I, I did a blog post on it. And I said, look, if you want to do these things, you know, these are issues of conscience. If, if it genuinely helps foster an appreciation in your heart, you know, for, for, you know, for the Bible, for the Old Testament, for, you know, what Jesus has done, you know, your walk with the Lord, by all means, do them. Do the Jewish calendar, observe the Sabbath. I mean, it, the, those things aren't bad. It's just that Jesus is better. So, so don't take the old things, the shadow things, the precursor things, and elevate them to the level of Jesus. Don't do that because they're not. They, they don't bring you to a saving relationship with God. They don't make God happier with you. We, we know, while we were yet sinners, you know, Christ died for us. God loved us all before we had any thought of doing anything God liked, okay? You know, we're, we're, we're sinners. We were aliens from God, all these New Testament ideas. You know, we were estranged, alien, you know, haters of God, all this stuff. 
God loved us even then. By by going by by adding the Torah to Jesus, if we think that oh, that that's going to make God's happiness level with me rise a little bit, that's just flawed thinking. It's just flawed thinking. But on the other hand, if you want to do these things, if they mean something to you personally, and you don't displace Jesus with them, you don't bring Jesus down to the level of the shadow things, then you know fine. Can you just have to you have to evaluate what, what what you're thinking theologically? You have to judge what you're thinking theologically by what Scripture says here in Hebrews, okay, and other places. So again, it just you go through the book of Hebrews, and, and like I said, I don't I don't know how some of the more sort of extreme Torah you know, folks how they can even tolerate Hebrews because everywhere you look at it, again, it's not saying that the Torah is bad that that the, the stuff is bad. It's saying it's lesser, it's inferior to what Jesus did. Verse 11, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered all or for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Uh, again, that's that's Hebrews ten eleven through fourteen. It's just some thoughts. Sitting at the right hand signifies completion. Okay, why? Well, Hebrews one three. If we go back there again, you know, a long time ago in our episode series here, Hebrews one three. You know, you have this the statement about you know Jesus being the radiance, the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. He upholds the universe by the word of His power, and after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he did what he needed to do, then he sat down. He was restored again to that that ruling, you know, seated at the right hand, his own throne position, you know, in heavens. So he doesn't have to like get up again and, and go do something else. It's done. It's finished. So after making a purification for sins, he sit he sits down at the right hand of God. Mission accomplished. He prepared for him a body. He he did the job. Now he's back, you know, in in the true tent, in the heavenly tent next to God. You know, mission accomplished. Now, the thing to notice here, you know, in in verse 14, for by a single offering, the offering of Jesus, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Our sanctification, our sanctification, not just our salvation, but our sanctification, our status with God, let's just, we can put it that way too is linked here to the sacrifice of Christ, which is superior to the Old Testament system of sacrifices. Our sanctification is in no sense linked to the shadow things, the things that have been replaced. So again, if you want to do those things, I, you know, I'm not objecting, and I, if I can be so bold, I don't think the writer of Hebrews you know, would, would be you know, you know, so bold to say, oh, those, that's bad, don't do that, you know, that's dangerous. You know, no. What, what what he would be concerned about is that you're not trading the inferior. You're not, you're not trading the superior for the inferior. You're not going back to a different gospel, a, a diff, you know, some sort of works-based performance, you know, performance-based notion uh, that a relationship with God is achieved or merited by doing the works of the law. That, that's what he'd be worried about. If you're clear on that, and you want to have a Passover meal, you want to do the Sabbath, you want to, you know, observe, you know, the Feast of, of Booths or Tabernacles, you know, whatever, you know, you, the, the Jewish calendar, go, go and do that and enjoy it, but, but keep it in its proper perspective. Know what it is and what it isn't. Go back to verse 15. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them. He's quoting again from the Old Testament. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And that That is really a kind of a punch in the nose statement, <laughs> you know, to, you know, again, for the writer of Hebrews to make to to you know a large portion of his audience is going to be again these these you know Jewish converts you know to to the faith, where there is forgiveness of these and he quoted the new covenant passages, he quoted Jeremiah thirty one here you know we we we've, we had an episode a whole episode on the new covenant how Christ you know is he's not only the Sabbath but he's he's the new covenant 
where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. This points again to the fact that Old Testament sacrifices, Old Testament sacrifices were about purgation, protection, decontamination of sacred space. They were not about forgiveness of moral evils and sins. If it had been about that, if the sacrifices had been about that stuff, then the statement here would apply to them. But it doesn't. If the Old Testament, if you really were forgiven of sin, like in a, in a moral sense, back in the Old Testament, if that's what the sacrifices were for, then there'd be no need to repeat them. But they did repeat them. Why were they always repetitive? Because the sacred space was always in danger of pollution. You, the person who, who you know, could participate at some level, either as a member of the community or a priest or the high priest, you know, there were different levels of participation, different you know, places you could occupy or not in the tabernacle system, you were always in danger of pollution as well. So this is why you had to have this system of repeated offerings and sacrifices. It, it, was, it was a large element of the logic because you were always in danger of polluting yourself or sacred space. Well, with Jesus, you're not. And bonus, bonus time, you're also, you also receive the forgiveness for moral sin as well. You get two for the price of one, okay? Two permanent for, the, you know, for, for, the, for what happened on the cross. You know, again, it, it's just it's superior in every sense. So he, he uses all that. Then he transitions in verse 9. If you're using the ESV and other Bibles probably have something similar, ESV has this section marked, the full assurance of faith. And what he's going to do is he's going to he's wrapping up the the high priestly ministry of Christ, and he's going to go back to the to the main issue. The main issue is are you are you understanding, are you comprehending, and are you embracing the real gospel, or are you stuck in a merit based mentality? Okay, that that's the real issue here. So in verse nineteen he says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. At that last verse, let's keep believing. It doesn't say, let's work even harder. Let's be even more careful. Let's make sure we do X, Y, Z and abstain from the things that we shouldn't do. Okay, let's just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and do a better job. No, he doesn't say any of that. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Don't stop believing. This holding fast the confession of our hope. Okay, we've seen that language before earlier in the book of Hebrews. We'll also see it a little bit you know, later. And, you know, he, he's been here before. This, this whole thing about keep embracing, keep holding on to, okay, the profession of your faith, the confession, you know, of, of the, the, the thing that you confessed to believe, again, the work of Jesus, that is the issue. The sacrifice of Jesus, our high priest, not only allows us to enter sacred space, Okay, back to verse 19, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Okay, the sacrifice of Christ not only allows you to enter sacred space, and he was the sacrifice, and he presides over the house of God. Verse 21, we have a great high, great priest over the house of God. Okay, this, the sacrifice, the, the priesthood, we have all that. So that not only allows us to enter sacred space, but his work on the cross means that we have new hearts. You get this imagery of cleansing, okay, right after quoting the New Covenant passages about having a clean heart, you actually have, you know, moral forgiveness. So again, back to the point I made a few minutes ago, we're, we are made fit for sacred space, but the bonuses were also forgiven, again, in, in the sense of moral guilt. And frankly, as, we, as this little section of the chapter says, that's all you need, and it doesn't need any repetition. I mean, how good is that? That's his point. How good is that? Verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I mean, you know, again, in, in light of all this, yeah, you know, we, we need to love each other. We need to, to live right. Not neglecting, verse 25, to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, now th- this verse, you know, I realize is often used, you know, to when I was growing up in, in my 
you know, first Christian context. And again, the, it, it, I'll just be honest with you. I, I, to me, there I still reap more benefits from it than liabilities. So I'm not going to be overly critical of it. But this verse was used basically to justify that whenever anything is happening at church, whenever the doors are open, you need to be there. And if you weren't, there was something wrong. You know, maybe your, your relationship with God wasn't right, or something like you know. And it, it, it was it was a it was an abuse. It was a misuse of the passage. You know, it, it's it's not the word ecclesia, the word that gets translated church, is not present in this passage. It is present twice in the book, Hebrews two twelve and Hebrews twelve three or twelve twenty three. And we've already seen Hebrews two twelve. When we get to chapter twelve, verse, verse twenty three, we'll see it again. The ecclesia, the congregation there, is really a reference to the divine council and glorified humans, exalted humanity, being made members of the council. It's not about earthly church gatherings in those two verses. But ecclesia does not occur here in verse 25, you know, when he says, don't neglect to meet together as the habit of some. The point here in this passage, Hebrews 10, 25, is, is he, the, the writer is afraid for those who habitually you know, refuse community. I mean, it, it is a, a present active participle, and neglecting there is present active. In Greek, it, it you know, the, the reference is, you know, to some activity that just is ongoing and then probably even habitual. Why is he worried about that? Well, the, he, he's worried that believers won't get the, the correct number of hours in a week to keep God happy? No. He's worried about that because the community can help encourage them to keep believing. They're under persecution. Life is hard. It has nothing to do with meeting a quota of hours per week to keep God happy. Again, that that is a honestly that that's a wicked legalizing of something that's really important. You know that 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 just far and away transcends that kind of thinking, especially if you appreciate the context here. This was a serious. This was this was a big deal. Because as people, you know, would, would drift away and they would, they would doubt, and, oh, should I go back to Judaism? And this is the whole focus of the book, the superiority of Christ. Why? It would be spiritual insanity to want to go back to this. You know, and, and if, you, if you turn away from, from the gospel of grace and you go back to the works system that, that you basically, you know, were enlightened at one point to go away from that, seeing that, you know, God had intended that this, this thing we call the cross, you know, and, and Jesus and all this stuff— then you know, it, you're in a perilous situation. You know how are you ever going to going to come come back to the you know to the truth? So he wants them to to be together. He wants the the ones who are struggling to be encouraged by the ones you know who who really you know see the importance of all this and are going to suffer with those people. And, you know, it's really about don't stop believing, not a quota of hours and activities. It's faith. It's not activity. Verse 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think? will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's the end of verse 31. Let's go back to verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I mean, people could jump on that without the context of everything in the book of Hebrews up to this point. People could jump on that and say, see, see, you know, if, 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 I, if I commit this particular sin or, or I have this, this bad habit, you know, and I can't break it, I'm going to lose my salvation. Okay, that is not what the passage is saying. A because of everything that has preceded, okay, your relationship with God is not based on works. It is based upon believing, okay, believing the gospel. It's, 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 it's been consistently about faith. And B, because of what he says in this passage, it's not about moral perfection. Okay, we'll, we'll say it again. That which you couldn't achieve through moral perfection, i.e., 
salvation. You can't work your way to heaven, okay? That which you can't achieve by moral perfection cannot be lost by moral imperfection. That's an axiomatic thing. It's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about stopping sinning deliberately so that you can be morally, you know, good enough. That's not what he's saying. Let's, let's just go to verse 26 and read the whole thing again. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, ah, oh, we're, we're violating something that we learned, you know, that we learned. We came to a, a particular thing of knowledge. Well, I wonder what that would be. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It seems like if we reject this point of knowledge, there's really no other way to be saved. Verse 27, but a fearful expectation of judgment. That's what we can look forward to. In other words, if we reject this thing we've learned, this, this knowledge of truth, then we can expect judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, for instance, dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses, using an Old Testament analogy. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Now, that language takes us back to Hebrews 6.6, 6. okay, the line about crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Okay, trampling underfoot the Son of God, crucifying once again the Son of God. Both of those are bad things in the book of Hebrews. It means rejecting the work of the cross. If you do that, if you do that, yeah, there is no other way to be saved. So there is no more sacrifice for sins. And if that's where you're at, you're going to be judged. And he's talking about the same thing, maintaining your belief in the gospel and not abandoning it, not choosing to no longer believe. Same thing he was talking about in chapter 6. So how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant? Well, what covenant has he been talking about? The new covenant which is linked to the gospel, the sacrifice of Jesus. Okay, Jesus was the, his blood was the testimony of the new covenant. He's just quoted the new covenant in this passage. And again, a couple chapters ago, we had the whole episode, you know, about the new covenant and how that is linked to the work of Jesus on the cross. So he's saying, Look, how much worse punishment if you profane what Jesus did, if you just reject it? Because you know, this is the means we're sanctified by. And, and how much worse is it going to be for, for anyone who has, quote, outraged the spirit of grace? I mean, it should be evident by this point. He's talking, again, he, he's, he's juxtaposing the gospel of grace with a merit-based system. If you reject the knowledge of the gospel, that's what he's talking about when, he's, when he talks about sinning intentionally, deliberately. In verse 26, again, doubts, questions, are not the same as intentional rejection. Okay, here he, you know, he, he, the emphasis is on a deliberate choice to no longer believe. That's what the writer of Hebrews is, has been afraid of the entire letter. That's the thing that's on his radar. That's the thing that concerns him choosing to no longer believe. Now, you know, since we did the episode on Hebrews 6, you know, I've got a handful of emails about, you know, oh, I you know, disagree, you know, you're, you're teaching you can lose your salvation. No, if you heard me correctly back then and now, there is no sin that you can, you can commit that will result in the loss of your salvation, okay? That which cannot be obtained by moral perfection cannot be lost by moral imperfection. But you can choose to reject the gospel. So what, what the, here, here, here's the alternative, really, in stark contrast. My view is that everyone who's in heaven believed and believes. They kept believing. They were believers. When, when you get to heaven someday, everybody you meet will have been a believer. The other view says there are going to be people in heaven who chose not to believe. Does that make any sense? I would suggest it doesn't. The Old Testament equivalent of that is, well, the, the Israelites, they were elect, you know. Well, yeah, a lot of them worship Baal. That, that's why we had the exile, Baal and Asherah and Ashtoreth and you know, all, this, all this crap, you know, this, this stuff they did in the Old Testament that brought on the exile. But, but they were still Israelites. They were at one, maybe at one time, you know, they worshiped Yahweh. So, yeah, they're going to be there too. Really? We've got Baal worshipers in heaven now? It just doesn't make any sense. So there's nothing you can do 
you know, sin wise, you know, moral violation wise, it's that you're going to lose your salvation because salvation isn't based on, on any of that anyway. It's based upon the simple question, do you believe the gospel or not? Do you believe? If you say, no, I don't, okay, you have to believe to have eternal life. It's, just, it's John 3.16. You have to believe to have eternal life. But again, we have turned the gospel into an incantation. I prayed a prayer, didn't really understand, you know, maybe I didn't understand parts of it, or, you know, I, when I prayed a prayer back when I was 8 or 10 or 50, I prayed that prayer. And, you know, I felt like I meant it. I was sorry for my sin. But today, if you ask me, I don't believe any of this stuff. Okay, you don't believe. You are not a believer. You're either a believer or you're not. But again, like I said, what we have done is we have treated, we have treated a, a, that person's prayer like it's a magic incantation. And that is not the way the gospel is presented in the New Testament. The way the gospel is presented in the New Testament is do you believe or not? Doesn't mean you never doubt. Doesn't mean you never struggle. Do you intentionally embrace this, even if you don't understand everything, even if you know, you're, you're suffering and life's frustrating and you got all sorts of problems? Do you, at the end of the day, do you believe this? Or at the end of the day, do you say, it's nonsense and garbage? I just reject it. I don't believe it. That's, that's the only question that matters. It's the only one that matters. So, and he's, he's back to, to the same kind of content here in Hebrews 10, and he's concerned. He's concerned. You know, you, I think we, we need to read Hebrews 10 in concert with Hebrews 6. That should be obvious at this point. If you reject the gospel of grace, well, no kidding. You know, you're in trouble. If you, if, you, if you do that, you reject the gospel of grace, you're going to be trampling underfoot the Son of God. You're going to be profaning the blood of the new covenant, profaning the work of Christ on the cross. You're going to outrage the spirit of grace. And God's wrath is going to be upon you like no kidding. You can't be saved apart from the grace of God shown through Christ on the cross. There is no other way of salvation. That's the point. Now, all that negativity aside, there is a little glimmer of hope here that I do think you know, goes back to chapter 6 as well. You know, chapter six was the language of you know the language of impossibility. Ah, oh, you know if you reject it, you know you, you you go from works to to grace, and you go back to works. You know it's it's impossible. You know the to to come back. You know this impossibility language we talked about in Hebrews six, which I, I suggested then really, you know really isn't like a categorical impossibility. Here you have this this phrase in verse twenty six, for if we go on sinning deliberately, well that language go on sinning suggests suggests that you might not keep on doing that. In other words, you might still turn around. In other words, you have to persist in unbelief. You have to persist in it. And if, if that's the, the, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the core issue, that you persist in it. And the language suggests that, well, maybe some won't persist. And so that's why the writer of Hebrews is, is warning them. He's, he's warning them because he still sees a little bit of hope for those people in this boat. And that's why he says things the way he does. Verse 32, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. He's look, life's tough. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Okay? Don't turn over to unbelief. Keep believing, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Now, this word confidence, therefore, don't throw away your confidence, is the same word used in Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Not our, not our confidence in our works, not our confidence in our moral performance, not our confidence in not doing the things we know we shouldn't do. No, our confidence and our boasting is in our hope. What's our hope? The hope is the gospel. The hope that it was done for us. Because Christ was faithful, and he's the one that's over God's house. It's also used in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence 
draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help. Find grace to help in time of need. And earlier in this chapter, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. In other words, the, the messaging here, don't throw away your confidence, is don't throw away your faith. Don't turn from the gospel. Verse 37, for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. Oh, there's by faith again. In other words, you're enduring not in your merit-based performance. You guys need to endure. You need to do more works. You need to keep it up. Good job. You know, you need to you need to just add a little bit of this and add a little bit of that to your profile, to your resume, to your spiritual CV. It's just so far from, from what he's talking about. The righteous shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But oh, wait a minute, I prayed a prayer. Like, it was 14, out there. I can't remember exact damn it. I know I prayed it a while ago. And yeah, I think all of this is nutty now. But I prayed that prayer, so I'm in. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. <laughs> I just don't know how much clearer it could be. You have to believe. You must believe. Verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith. Doesn't say those who have moral perfection, those who have a good report card with God. No, it says those who have faith and preserve their souls. See, faith is what preserves you in terms of eternal life, not works. You know, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That's the last verse of Hebrews 10. Now, all of that, he goes through all of that. And then what do you think he does? Hebrews 11. It's the Hall of Faith. I got news for you. There are some real screw-ups in the Hall of Faith. There really are. And we're going we're gonna to meet them. You know, we're going to jump into Hebrews 11 in the next episode. But I'll tell you what you won't find there. You won't find people who didn't believe at the end of the day. That's what you won't find there. There's a reason it's called the Hall of Faith. And the line, by faith, is repeated over and over and over and over again in the chapter. And it's not called the hall of goodness, the hall of doing things right. Because we did more right than wrong, because we were consistent in our behavior. No, it says by faith, this person did that and the other, you know, th there's a reason for all that. Hebrews 11 is backdropped by this whole discussion. It is what it is because of, of this, this whole framing of the issue. So the writer next time is going to go through, start going through to, for his audience, some just example after example after example. And they're not all of the same character quality. <laughs> uh, just, you know, again, if you've read Hebrews 11, you know that they're not all shining examples of, of people who never had a, you know, an issue, never had a problem, always had the perfect behavioral track record. That's not what you're going to find. Again, what you will find is people who, at the end of the day, they believed. They didn't give up on their belief. Mike, can we go back to verse 26 and break it down for me a little bit? It says, verse 26 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Can you break down that in a believer yeah. versus unbeliever mindset? Because can't a believer still believe in the one true God, but yet consciously choose to keep on sinning? Well, the issue I do think with the sinning is maintaining their, their faith in Christ. Okay. So that, that I think is where we, we camped on in the episode. So in that sense, if we go on sinning deliberately, in other words, if we, if, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth. What I think he's getting that there is if we are persisting in not believing this anymore. But to your question, let's say you have a person, again, who, you know, they, they struggle with sin, right? So that isn't erased by Hebrews 10. It's just not what Hebrews 10 verse 26 is about. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if that, if that helps, but yes, 
Christians struggle with sin. Every Christian struggles with sin. Paul says, "Who can deliver me from the you know this this wretched body of death?" You know, okay. I mean, Paul struggled, you know, with sin, but that isn't what's in his crosshairs in Hebrews ten twenty six through verse thirty one. Again, we have to take the take his language as a unit. I think we also need to interpret it in light of Hebrews chapter 6, uh, which, again, he borrows from Hebrews 6 a couple times in here. We also need to interpret it in light of verse 35 about throwing away the confidence. We also need to interpret it in light of verse 38 about the righteous shall live by faith. And if you don't have faith, if you shrink back, then I have no pleasure in you. So what I'm saying about Hebrews 10, 26 and onward is not a denial that Christians will struggle with sin. It is a denial that the focus of what was in the you know what, what the writer's trying to get at is losing salvation by virtue of sinning. That is not what he's arguing for. He's the sinning that he has in mind that that's going to you know be that is the issue in his head is turning away from faith. It's it's trampling the, underfoot the Son of God. It's profaning the, the work on the cross. It's outraging the Spirit of grace. That's what he has in view. That's the sinning he's talking about. So I don't think Hebrews ten twenty six and onward is talking about the Christian who is just struggling, you know, with with some particular sin. I mean that 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 happens, uh, obviously, and you know, even when it does happen, you know, in in my own life and somebody else's life, you know, when it does happen, we need to realize, okay, why why are we struggling with this? Why? You know why? Why should we even care? Well, we don't. We, we're not caring because oh, if I quit this, God's going to love me now, and then I get to go to heaven. If you're thinking that way, you fundamentally misunderstand the gospel. Okay, the reason you should you know deal with that sin in your life is because yeah, it, it could harm other people depending on what it is. It might have a direct impact on on someone else's life. That's bad. But you should you should you should try to be holy. You should try to live a holy life, a, a godly life, because you appreciate what the Lord has done for you. You want to show by your life where your loyalty and your faith lies. It lies in Christ. Okay? I'm, I'm not doing this or I am doing this because you know, I, I, I'm a believer. I, I, I'm a disciple of Jesus. And I want the world to know that. I want, you know, to, I, I, I want to be grateful. I want to be use, usable you know, to, to the Lord. If I don't get this thing out of my life, then you know, that's going to impede you know, what I can do for the Lord. There's all sorts of motivations uh, that Scripture presents to us on why we should, again, try to live a certain way. But none of them are so that if I do this behavior, God's going to love me now, and then I get to go to heaven. And, and that's where a lot of people, I think, are trapped. They, they, don't, they, they get sort of misdirected away from the motivations that we should have uh, when we struggle with sin. Both, you know, again, to be useful to the Lord, to bless the Lord, if we can, you know, say it that way. Again, to show our gratitude and to avoid harming other people, being a bad testimony, to to avoid keeping people from embracing the gospel. There's all sorts of reasons why we should live a certain way, but people sort of get trapped into thinking that God's love for them is somehow linked to this behavioral issue. Again, before you ever even had a thought, ever had a care in the world about what God thought about you, Christ died for you. It happened 2,000 years ago, okay? It was planned for in the mind of God in eternity past. God loved you then. You're not going to boost his disposition or give him a loving disposition if you do or don't do a certain act today. He loved you from the beginning. Okay? It has nothing to do with merit-based you know, thinking, a merit-based approach to salvation. But we, we tend to be trapped uh, in that, both, I think, because of maybe a religious tradition we've been taught uh, before, maybe growing up, and because we feel guilty uh, when, when we do something that God, we know God would disapprove of, and we sort of we process that guilt in terms of God loving or not loving us anymore. And we, we turn it into a salvation situation that depends in part on us. And that's not actually the gospel. All right. That sounds good. Mike, I also want to mention we're going to do, uh, we're going to have a call for questions about 
Hebrews specifically. So at the end of it, we're nearing the end of uh, the book of Hebrews. So we would like to ask for our listeners to uh, email me, Trey Strickland at gmail.com with your questions specifically about the book of Hebrews. And, uh, and if we get enough and we feel like we have uh, some added value to that, we'll do an episode strictly on uh, Hebrews Q and a, and then after that, episode, we plan on doing uh, one or two more uh, regular Q&A episodes. So uh, we're going to try to finish wrapping up the book of Hebrews first in the first part of 2018, Mike. And uh, uh, we appreciate everybody's support in the year 2017. And we think 2018 is going to be much bigger moving forward. Uh, We have big plans for that. So uh, yes, we do. We appreciate everybody <laughs> who has left us a uh, review and rated us wherever you consume us. That helps new people discover us. So we hope to grow and we need your help. So we appreciate everybody that's uh, with us and everybody that's going to help us try to get this yeah, to it, more people. Yeah, these, these are not, I mean, they, they feel trivial, you know, review, you know, give us a little, you know, this or that star, you know, but it actually matters. I mean, it, it actually does matter. So it might sound like a kind of a trivial thing, but it's not. All right, Mike. Well, we look forward to chapter 11 next week and uh, look forward to the new year. And I uh, appreciate everybody out there, the Naked Nation, and uh, want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.